In our last study of the Lord's Prayer, we encountered the petition, Your Kingdom Come. Jesus assumed that the disciples would well understand the concept of kingdom, seeing as it was a central focus of first century Judaism. In order for us to understand Jesus' statement, we need to thoroughly understand the theological concept of the kingdom of God as found in the Old Testament, and then fill out our study with a look at the New Testament teaching on the subject. We will do this in three sessions. In the first session, we will look at definitions, distinctions, and Old Testament antecedents. So let's begin. Introduction When one approaches the New Testament, the concept of the Kingdom of God is both pervasive and perplexing. It is pervasive in that it is perhaps the overarching theme of the Bible. Paul Benwer, in his book, Understanding End Times Prophecy, writes, quote, The Kingdom of God is the great theme of the Scriptures. God is the eternal king who rules now and shall rule in the future. End quote. Alva J. McLean, in the definitive book on this subject, The Greatness of the Kingdom, writes, quote, The kingdom of God is, in a certain and important sense, the grand central theme of all Holy Scripture. End quote. Similar statements are made by other evangelical scholars. And even non-evangelical scholars, such as John Bright, uh, concur with this statement. John Bright notes, for instance, quote, For the concept of the kingdom of God involves, in a real sense, the total message of the Bible. Not only does it loom large in the teachings of Jesus, it is to be found in one form or another through the length and breadth of the Bible. End quote. While numerous other suggestions have been made by theologians as to what constitutes the central theme of the Bible, whether promise, covenant, the glory of God, or something else, all scholars agree that the kingdom of God is pervasive and constitutes one of the grand themes of Scripture. Therefore, it is imperative that Christians familiarize themselves with the concept of the kingdom of God so that they can rightly divide the word of truth. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15. It is also perplexing in the sense that it is used by both John the Baptist and Jesus, and neither of them stops to define it. Many Christians, perhaps the vast majority, simply assume a definition or caricature without an informed biblical backdrop. Jesus, like John the Baptist before him, uses the expression without defining it precisely because he anticipated that his Jewish audience already understood from the Old Testament the nature of this kingdom. Most Christians, on the other hand, do not well understand the Old Testament and therefore do not possess the background information that John's and Jesus' original audiences enjoyed. Usually, we have obtained our understanding of theological concepts from what we have learned from others rather than directly from the Bible. In order then to understand this essential doctrine, a careful examination of the biblical text is necessary. Furthermore, clear definitions and distinctions must be developed. An Old Testament as well as intertestamental antecedents need to be surveyed. It is to these issues that we now turn. In our second study, we will examine the Davidic covenant recorded in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 1 through 17. And in our final study, we will look at the nature of the kingdom of God in the New Testament, seeking to answer three questions. One, does the kingdom of God refer metaphorically to a spiritual kingdom? or literally to a physical kingdom, or to both. Number two, is the kingdom in view presently in existence, or is it strictly in the future? And finally, number three, what is the relationship between this kingdom 
and the church. Let's begin now with some definitions and distinctions. Definitions. What is meant by the phrase kingdom of God is exceedingly important. We must be clear about what we are talking about. An erroneous definition will lead to a vastly different understanding of the theology of the kingdom and indeed will shape the course of one's eschatology and ecclesiology. Paul N. defines kingdom when he writes, quote, The normal use of the term kingdom denotes a dominion or physical sphere of rule involving a ruler, a people who are ruled, and a physical territory where the rule takes place. Alva J. McLean's definition is most helpful. Quote, a general survey of the biblical material indicates that the concept of kingdom envisages a total situation containing at least three essential elements. First, a ruler with adequate authority and power. Second, a realm of subjects to be ruled. And third, the actual exercise of the function of rulership. End quote. By the way, I cannot overstate the importance of Maclean's book, The Greatness of the Kingdom. It is the absolute best book written on the subject. Maclean has an incredible grasp of it. Every court Christian should make it a priority to read this book through carefully. Maclean's three essential elements can be further unpacked. 1. A sovereign authoritative ruler. There must be a ruler. This ruler must have the authority and power to rule. In the biblical concept of the kingdom of God, that ruler is God. Second, Chronicles chapter 20 verse 6 states, King Jehoshaphat said, O Lord, the God of our fathers, art thou not God in the heavens? And are thou not ruler over all the kingdoms of the nations? Power and might are in thy hand, so that none can stand against thee. Second, a realm to rule. There must be a realm to rule. This element of a kingdom focuses on the subjects to be ruled and not on the authority possessed by the ruler. In the kingdom of God, God exercises his rule over those in the heavens and on the earth. Since the term kingdom can have an abstract connotation, some have argued that its primary meaning is reign rather than realm or people. George Eldon Ladd, an extremely influential scholar to a previous generation, exemplifies this interpretation. He argued that kingdom is clearly neither the domain nor the subjects, but rather only the authority to rule. From this understanding, Ladd emphasizes his already and not yet view of the kingdom, which has been appropriated by a great many scholars. In response, however, it is difficult to comprehend a kingdom as only existing in the abstract. Moreover, when the passages are studied in context, inevitably an authority over someone or something is found. Charles Feinberg ushers a crushing blow to the abstract interpretation when he notes, quote, It is well known from a study of the Old Testament that the Semitic frame of mind emphasizes the concrete rather than the abstract. It would have been ludicrous to an Old Testament saint to say nothing of the Jew today to speak of a kingdom of the Messiah and mean by that only a spiritual state or condition by means of repentance such as was called forth by the preaching of the prophets. For the Semitic mind, a kingdom is primarily a realm, then the authority exercised therein. End quote. More recently, Graham Goldsworthy has written, quote, Some have sought to distinguish between a realm and a dynamic of God ruling and to opt for one or the other as the meaning of the kingdom. I find this distinction unconvincing. 
The Bible does not leave the kingdom in the abstract. If God's rule, if God rules, he rules somewhere, even if somewhere is everywhere. There is no abstract rule without a realm, end quote. Finally, number three, the exercising of authority. In a kingdom, there must be the actual exercising of authority. In theory, of course, one might propose that a ruler could temporarily leave his realm or of authority and still be viewed as ruler, but there can be no kingdom in a full and complete sense without the active exercising of that authority. First Chronicles chapter 29, verses 11 and 12 includes all three of these essential elements. Yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor. For everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. Wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things. In your hands are strength and power to exalt and give strength to all. Distinctions. When one re reads through the Bible, there is a seeming contradiction between statements concerning the kingdom of God. It is spoken of as something which has always existed, yet in other places as having a definite historical or future beginning. Sometimes it is set forth as universal, outside of which there is no created thing, whereas it is also revealed as a localized rule established on the earth. It appears often as under the direct rule of God and at other times as mediated through human instrumentality. These and other contrasts demonstrate that two broad distinctions must be kept in mind. While it is probably imprecise to speak of two kingdoms of God, one should speak of the universal kingdom of God and the mediatorial kingdom of God, with the latter being a subset of the former. The universal kingdom of God. The universal kingdom of God refers to God's all-encompassing, invisible, eternal reign over all of creation. Absolutely everything is under the sovereign authority and rule of God. Jeremiah declared, He is the living God and the everlasting King. Jeremiah 10, verse 10. Other passages that allude to this kingdom include 1 Chronicles 29, verses 11 and 12, Psalms 10, verse 16, 29, verse 10, 74, verse 12, 90 verses 1 through 6, 93 verses 1 through 5, 103 verse 19, 145 verse 13, Lamentations chapter 5 verse 19, Daniel chapter 4 verses 17, 25, 32, Acts chapter 17 verse 24, and numerous other passages. The Mediatorial Kingdom of God the mediatorial kingdom of God, sometimes referred to as a theocratic kingdom, refers to God's rule over the earth in contrast to his rule over all of creation through indirect administration in contrast to direct ruling, and in this case through human mediators. This was established in Eden Genesis chapter 1 verses 26 through 28 and will continue in various iterations into the eternal state Revelation chapters 21 and 22 For instance in Genesis chapter 1 verse 26 God gives a dominion mandate to Adam and Eve so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds of the sky over the livestock and over all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. This is confirmed in verse 28. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. 
After the birth of the nation of Israel, we see this form of the kingdom in the leadership of Moses, Joshua, the judges, Israel's kings, and prophetically in the Davidic or Messianic king. The mediatorial kingdom of God occupies the majority of the references to God's kingdom in the Bible. The New Testament focuses almost solely on the future phase of this mediatorial kingdom of God, the millennial kingdom under the rule of the Davidic king. Old Testament and Intertestamental Antecedents The phrase kingdom of God does not occur in the Old Testament, although the idea is present throughout. In both the Old Testament and Jewish intertestamental literature, God is presented as king. Deuteronomy chapter 9, verse 26 in the Septuagint. 1 Samuel chapter 12, verse 12. Psalms 24, verse 10 and 29, verse 10. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 5, chapter 33, verse 22, Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 15, Zechariah chapter 14, verses 16 and 17. He is ascribed a royal throne in Psalms 9, verse 4, 45, verse 6, 47, verse 8, Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1, and chapter 66, verse 1. Ezekiel chapter 1 verse 26 and Sirach chapter 1 verse 8 and occasionally his continuous or future reign is affirmed Psalms 10 verse 16 and 146 verse 10 Isaiah chapter 24 verse 23 and in the wisdom of Solomon chapter 3 and verse 8 The concept of the mediatorial kingdom of God pervades the Old Testament. Hundreds of Old Testament texts could be cited in relation to this kingdom. It is an omnipresent concept. The preponderance of kingdom terminology in the Old Testament refers to the eschatological phase which is related to the Davidic covenant given in 2 Samuel chapter 7. Reference, whether explicit or implicit to the kingdom of the Messiah or descriptions of the Messianic age are almost ubiquitous in the Old Testament and Second Temple Judaism. Both the Old Testament and Jewish intertestamental literature depict this kingdom as an earthly kingdom with national Israel restored to its land as the head of the nations and with the Messiah ruling from Jerusalem, and exercising worldwide dominion. The antecedent of kingdom of God or kingdom of heaven in the preaching and teaching of John the Baptist, Jesus, the apostles, and the early church is the Old Testament and Second Temple Judaism conception of the kingdom of God as promised in the Davidic Covenant. In our next study, we will specifically address the nature of this covenant, which will uh, bridge the way to our study to the New Testament concept of the kingdom of God.